Hello everybody, in this video I'm going to give you some information about the northern and southern states uh, in America in the mid 19th century to help you make the decision whether this is really the disunited states of America. So ultimately it, there's going to be a civil war, but could you really have seen this coming if you go back 20 or so years and you, you kind of look in the 1840s, if you'd turned up would you have seen such differences between the North and the South that some kind of schism or fight or divide uh, was inevitable. So this conflict does take place and it, it is mainly uh, between free northern states, although there were um, some southern slave states that were a part of the Union uh, as well from the Upper South uh, against the Confederacy, which is made up of southern slave owning states. So that war is going to take place, so or did take place. So again, we're looking at the period beforehand. Now, the North and South certainly had distinctive economic systems uh, and characteristics in terms of their society uh, and their politics, but they also had a huge amount in common. So this video will examine some of the those characteristics of the North and South and help you judge whether the first half of the 19th century, America had really become the disunited states. So, so looking at the economy to start off with, so the northern economy is based on free labour, so that is people who are paid wages and earn money for their work. So the, the north is often characterised as being highly industrialised, but this, this is a gross generalisation. It, 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 it was more the case that, that it was on its way towards industrialization at this point in time. There was industry in the north uh, and more industry than there was in the south, but it wasn't the case that the, and the north was an enormous industrial powerhouse at this point. Uh, it wasn't. Um, about 68 percent of the workforce in 1800 worked in agriculture and by 1860 this had dropped to 40 percent. So yes, it wasn't a, a majority anymore by the time you get to 1860, but it was through most of the, the first half of, of the uh, 19th century. And a northerner was far more likely to be an independent farmer than they were to be an industrial worker. So the, one of the other key things about the northern economy when it comes to agriculture is the northern farmers produce food, uh, whilst a lot of the, the, the south farms were producing cash crops such as cotton and tobacco uh, and sugar, whilst the, in the north they were, they were growing um, wheat and uh, corn and things like that, uh, and raising uh, lar large amounts of um, animals as well. Now, only four northern manufacturing industries employed more than 50,000 people, so most industry was on a fairly small scale. Uh, there were centres of trade and industry like New York, but these places are not typical. And again, it's still the case in the, the northern states of America today. If you go to the, the big port, big cities on the eastern seaboard, they're very different to what you would have found um, if you go deeper inland. Um, New York's wealth was, was in part due to economic relations with the South. So, for example, uh, lending money and financing some of the plantation owners, uh, at, at the shipping industry in New York, export, exporting cotton, exporting cotton to places like Britain. So it was economically different to the South, but the two economies were intertwined. Uh, the North uh, had a lot more uh, railway line than the South, twice as much, had a lot more people. Uh, than the south, so that was more uh, densely populated. Uh, and almost all the trade that uh, the United States did it came into and or went out of uh, northern ports. So what was northern society like? Well, it, it's often portrayed um, as being um, really, really kind of urbanised. But again, this is a bit of an exaggeration. Only about a quarter of the population were living in uh, towns or cities in 1850. Uh, it sometimes was said that the, the North was far more egalitarian than the South. And again, that's not completely true. About 10% uh, of the, the Northerners, the 10% wealthiest Northerners, owned about 70%, 68% of the wealth. So we're seeing wealth concentrated in the hands of the few. Now, those few uh, tended to be the big capitalists, tended to be uh, the people who owned the industries that ran, ran the banks, big, uh, ran the big trading firms. So it, it's businessmen who dominate the wealth in the north. 
One of the really things that made, one of the things that made the Northern uh, Society very different from the South was immigration. Between 1830 and 1860, there were five million migrants that settled in the Northern States in America. Uh, in 1860, about one in six Northerners were immigrants. So this has a profound impact on Northern society. It was far more varied and far more multicultural compared to society in the South. Uh, immigration from Ireland and Italy and Germany in particular brought um, large Catholic populations into a lot of the Northern cities. And the groups tended to, to congregate in the cities, places like New York, which gave them quite a unique character. And America is often referred to as the melting pot, where you've got people from all around the world. And that was far more true of the North than it was of the South. The Northerners were generally better educated than um, their contemporaries in the South, and therefore they were more likely to embrace modern ideas and ideas about reform. And also, again, immigration brought a lot of these new ideas across from Europe. So it is a, a more diverse uh, society in, and one where the, we've got more of a mixture of things like religions and, and backgrounds of, of the people there. So northern politics. Well, northern politics, again, one of the things you, you, you might hear uh, said about northern politics is, is people will write about and talk about abolitionists. Well, abolitionists did exist. But if you're in this period, kind of mid 19th century, the, their importance shouldn't be exaggerated, really. Numerically, they are a, a minority in the north. Um, they were a group that was divided. So you had a gradual abolitionists who wanted to eventually work towards abolition. And then you had immediate abolitionists who said it must be done immediately. And they were active in the in the 1830s and 1840s, but they, they didn't really have a hugely significant impact on the North. And really in the North, you've got three groups. You've got the abolitionists who are very anti-slavery at one extreme. At the other extreme, you've got those who have a kind of a vested interest in slavery, who are, are making their money through it, even though they don't have slaves themselves in the North. But they their interactions with Southern uh, cotton industry, for example, might be making them lots of money. And then you've got the kind of the group in the middle who were generally not hugely f keen on the idea, but it's not something that concerns them because it's not happening uh, where they live. In New England, it's got some really strong kind of democratic traditions, uh, particularly things like town hall meetings where local decisions are made. Uh, and generally speaking, we, we seem, seem to see this more democratic nature in the North. Um, but the political characteristics we see in the North were the state governments and, uh, are based on kind of federal design with a, a governor, equivalent of the president, and then the state congress, uh, often with two houses, equivalent of, of the House of Representatives and the Senate, and then a kind of state supreme court. So, and that happens in the North and it happens in the South as well. So that, that's more of a something they have in common. There is variation in the franchise all the way across America, including in the North. So who could vote? Um, but all states are, are men only. Um, it, generally speaking, most states restricted the franchise based on wealth or property. Uh, now, black suffrage is not common in the North. It is seen at various points in, in New York uh, and in New Jersey and in Pennsylvania. But it's temp really quite temporary in New, Je New Jersey and Pennsylvania. In, in New York, it lasts longer. Uh, but even in New York, there was a referendum in 1860, uh, and which went quite strongly against the idea of universal black male suffrage. Um, and so black male suffrage existed, but only if, the, if certain kind of wealth and property criteria were hit. In the North, and this was exactly the same in the South, there's, we've got two parties competing. So the Whigs and the Democrats are both national parties. So they both try to appeal to Northern voters and also try, were at the same time, trying to appeal to Southern ones. Um, the Whigs were the party uh, of business uh, uh, and in favour of a kind of stronger federal government. And the Democrats were, were seen as the party of ordinary men uh, and smaller government. So the southern economy, well, is it wildly different to that of the north? Well, in, in one instance, it, it absolutely is because it's based on slave labor. So there are about four, about four million slaves in the southern states uh, and they are doing all the hard work producing the cash crops of in particular cotton, but also um, sugar and uh, tobacco. And this is what makes the south really wealthy. So the people doing all the work are not earning the money. but not all white Southerners are slave owners. In fact, 75% of Southern families don't own any slaves at all. 
Um, most white uh, white southerners were were self sufficient farmers, uh, as was the case in the north. So there's actually a degree of similarity. I mean, the South is more agricultural, but 81% uh, of the population working agriculture. Uh, and th But this agriculture is very profitable. About 50% of the value of US exports was from cotton. And a lot of the, the South disliked tariffs. We see this in the nullification crisis. Um, and tar tariffs are, are taxes on, on imports on imported goods, but because the South was reliant on exporting cash crops to places like Britain and then in exchange importing European luxuries, they didn't want to get into this idea of tariffs because they didn't want to uh, fall out with their, their really important foreign buyers. And they didn't want to pay more for the goods they were importing as well. So the South and the Northern economies are, are inter-reliant. So the, the South reliant on the North to purchase uh, some of the, a lot of their goods and also to export um, a lot of their goods to, to places like Britain. And they also reliant for their finances on Northern banks. So we got that into interrelation. Now, sometimes from that interrelation uh, causes some resentment uh, and the South feeling it's getting a bad deal out of it all. But really, their economy wasn't set up to, to run independently. It needed it's all well and good growing cotton and it being very profitable, but if you can't actually get it to Britain, you're not going to make that money. Lots of Southerners did actually push for the improvement of railways and telegraph networks. Often the South the Southern economy seen as being really, really backward, and in, in a lot of ways it was, and in, in, in obviously very in particularly in its reliant on slave labour. But not all Southerners were opposed to all kind of modern development. And there was some industry. I mean, the most notable of this is the Tradiga Ironworks in Richmond, which was one of the top, the five biggest uh, ironworks in the whole of the USA. So it is not the case that the South is completely without industry and the North is uh, completely industrial. It, it, it isn't the case that the um, the everyone in the, all, all the white population in the South are, are slave owners making loads of money. So again, there is some uh, th there is some bits where there's a bit more nuance and a bit more to think about. So Southern society, and this this is quite a perplexing one. I mean, it, it is very, very, very rural. Only 6% of the population lived in towns bigger than 2,500 back in 1840. Uh, over 80% of the population worked in agriculture. Southern society is dominated by the planter class, so the, the super rich uh, slave owners who lived on the big plantations. Uh, I mean, they are not completely hereditary group, but there are, there, there are quite strong hereditary elements to it. There, there you do get examples of self-made men who, who rise up and, and become wealthy planters. Um, but those planter families, they dominate um, government, they dominate society. Uh, the southern men uh, are seemed a lot more concerned by honour than the, their northern counterparts. They're far more likely to react violently to any kind of personal insult, for example, um, they were renowned for duelling. Uh, and then violence is also really endemic in society in the South, particularly because if you look at the treatment of the slaves. And so we've got a very much a hierarchical society with the planters at the top and slaves at the bottom. Um, we've got a society which could be very violent. The Southern perceived that their, their way of life as being um, hugely superior to the North. They were very disdainful of what they talked about, Yankee materialism and, and the uh, the pursuit of uh, making money and industry and commerce in, in the North. Um, again, it seems a little odd since they were pursuing making lots of money through not doing much work in, in terms of groups like the planters. Um, the, the, the South really prided itself on being gracious and hospitable and having far superior manners to the to, to the Northerners. And again, all that seems a bit incongruous, a bit odd in the context of this was a society based on slavery. Now, <coughs> Southern politics, well, the, the Southern states, um, states tend to have more people who believed in states' rights, and that's the idea of a, a smaller and weaker federal government. But the, both the Whigs and the Democrat parties did compete in the South, just as they did in the North. Um, there was a, a huge desire to protect the institution of slavery and expand it into new territories. Um, the, the planter class tended to dominate um, the key positions in politics, therefore reinforcing this desire to protect the institution of slavery. So I hope that's given you um, some insight into the North and the South in terms of their economies, their societies and their politics. 
Uh, and there are things to remember about what united them as well. So we've not only got the fact that we've got the second party system uh, with the Whigs and the Democrats competing in both in the North and the South. We've got shared political um, systems. So they both in the northern states and in the southern states, they tended to mimic or copy the federal system with the, the governor protect is your, your kind of smaller version of a president and then the state legislatures and the state supreme courts. There's also a lot of shared shared history and there's shared language and, and those interactions in terms of the economy in particular. I mean, these are not completely separate bubbles. They are kind of interreliant on each other. Right, I hope you found that useful. Please remember um, to like uh, and, and make sure you subscribe and then you'll have easy access to a lot more videos on this and other themes in history and politics. Thank you very much for watching.